Hello, everyone. It is another edition of Lockdown Guardians. It is your two co-hosts, uh, Jeff Ellis, Justin Lada, on the show today. We are going to preview the Yankees. We're going to talk about the series that the Guardians just won against Tampa and rather fantastic fortune where let's maybe I just start here. You don't need a big rundown. I will say I want to thank you for making Lockdown Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever it is you get podcasts. Justin, you... One thing that's very basic that we got right and wrong. So what I got right was I said they'd win in two. I said they'd win the first two, but I predicted a blowout. You said they would go three, but you correctly predicted, in my opinion, the more impressive thing, that these would be one run games. Uh, You know, what was, did you have any thought about that after that one had ended that uh, you had, you really nailed that one right on the head, hit the nail on the head? I honestly forgot about that until you reminded me. That's that's what I said. I did say three games, but I don't I don't know if anybody in Cleveland could have taken three one run games after, especially if they would have lost a one run game on Saturday. That would have been hard to come back to on Sunday. So yeah, I don't know. That was just pure guessing how Cleveland played ball all season long that it would just be a one run game because these two teams were, we said, evenly matched, right? Yeah, hundred percent. It- I agree. It, it felt like if they didn't win, Sunday was going to be rough, like just matchup wise. But they won, so we don't have to fixate on that. Uh, one of my favorite things, I don't know, you know, we talked about it a little bit before. I enjoyed, I took a lot of shot and for, sh- I can't say, <coughs> I'm going to cough on Mike, which everyone loves. Uh, I didn't cough at all in our pre talk. And I told him I'm going to start coughing the minute this mic goes live. But uh, the schadenfreude of all these people, all these Mets fans being like, oh, you know, enjoy your parting gift of getting eliminated or swept. It's like, uh, I think I said Mets, I meant to say Twins fans, but uh, because the Mets are losing. But uh, to be like, yeah, hey, they won two. When's the last time your team won two games just in general in the postseason? Uh, I don't know. Did you run into any of that? Were you having any moments of kind of enjoyment about the fact that even once this team made the postseason, people keep doubting them, keep counting them out, and they just swept the race. I will say I did see some Twitter accounts that was doubting Cleveland all season long. They were doubting Cleveland all season long. And I saw one in particular who said, uh, was giving their best bets for the, the wild card round and said, I like the Rays the most to beat the, the Guardians. Like that was his key, like his series he felt the most confident about. And it was somebody who had been saying all season that the twins were going to win the division by double digit games. And I'm like, this, this guy just hasn't learned his lesson that you don't count out Cleveland. I, I said this on the way home Saturday. I said, I think, I feel like you'll remember. I think people called this the 2014 San Francisco giants baseball's cockroaches. I think the guardians are this year's baseball's cockroaches. I think they just, they just won't go away. And one of the things that makes them that case is this bullpen you and I have both talked about how great it is, but for anyone who was uninformed, could there have been a better lesson than Saturday's game? You mean the pitching or just the fact that they, like uh, how good it is like that. Yeah. I mean that, that bullpen, you know, the big, the Hydra at the back, the big three, and then the next two guys, I mean, they had five innings with no, not even a hit given up between the bullpen. It was just for the uninitiated. That was a chance to see, and if you're someone on the national stage who hasn't paid attention, like why I feel like this might be the best bullpen in baseball. I really enjoyed everybody finding out about Oscar Gonzalez and his SpongeBob SquarePants theme song. Like that was a cool thing for everybody to be like, has this been happening all year? But no, I think, I think what we talked about was that um, Cleveland had the better bullpen. And I think that's what happened on Saturday is that Cleveland just outlasted them. They, they got, I mean, Sam, I don't think anybody would have predicted Sam Hedges throwing three innings. And thank goodness he did, because I will say a year ago, I was, I was out on Sam Hedges and I got that wrong Same. along with, yeah, along with Oscar Gonzalez, two guys I was so wrong about. Um, <laughs> yeah. Which is why Jeff and I always agree. And it's always, it's always super boring when we agree all the time, but um, they, they had a better bullpen and the Yankee, or I'm sorry, the Yankees, I'm already thinking about the Yankees, the Rays had to go deep into their bullpen and they, they brought out Corey Kluber, which I thought was weird, but they, they went through their entire bullpen and Cleveland showed they have a better bullpen than Tampa. And that's, that's what it came down to. I mean, it came down to someone making a mistake, obviously, but yeah, Cleveland outlasted them and proved their bullpen was just deeper by one run, I guess. And you know, you and I were texting during the game, you were at the game. 
I thought it was kind of interesting. Like you and I are like, where are they going to bring in the lefties? Like I kept thinking, okay, Beeks is going to come in. And, you know, they were doing a whole thing where it was very interesting because it'd be like, okay, we'll put in a lefty for Josh Naylor. That lefty will stay in and then we'll bring in a righty. And then like they had like very distinct start and stop points. Uh, but then they left Kluber in. And I get it. I mean, it's a righty on a righty with Oscar Gonzalez and you need him to eat some innings. But then it turns out someone like Jalen Beeks never gets in the game. Was it, I don't know. It felt like for both of us, we thought it was a little weird that they weren't leaning into the sheer number of lefties their pen had more. Yeah, I, I don't really, I'm not going to proclaim the know to be an expert on, on Jalen Beeks and how good he is or isn't. But just if you're looking at the numbers on the surface, obviously Cleveland, we know Cleveland not as good against lefties. Um, I would, yeah, I would assume Jalen Beeks would have been the guy to go to and just play off that matchup. And the fact that Kluber had a really bad second half. And here's one thing I want to, I want to point out too. Uh, that we don't have to spend a lot of time talking about because we didn't talk about it before the show, but um, that could have been Corey Kluber's last pitch as a major league baseball player. He did not have a good second half and he is what 35. There's no guarantees. Anybody gives him a deal this winter, maybe a minor league deal, but there's a chance that could have been his last pitch as a major league player. That's weird. I hate to see it personally. And I don't know. I always feel like pitchers have nine lives, but no, it's a very good point. I, and I haven't heard anyone else mention it. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things that, you know, it could it, te- could it be the end of the line for him? Uh, just for those who weren't, didn't know with the splits this year. So the first half, second half advanced stats splits, you know, I like to look at something like F- FIP and his FIP data actually was a 377. So it wasn't the worst, but it was definitely better in the first half and some of his basic stuff. Uh, I think he had a five year rate in the second half. Am I not on Corey Kluber? Why does it give me batting stats? No, I don't but think yeah, Corey Kluber's no, batting stats are good. No, I, I guess that's maybe that's opponent average. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, 514 ERA in the second half after a 373 in the first half. Um, I'd have to you know dig in, but he, it could be that could be the end. I think uh, somebody might sign I'll him, but there's no see. guarantee, or you know, maybe someone feels like hey, he got tired, maybe it's time to look at him in a bullpen role. Yeah, that was not a great audition for, but no. it was a weird thing. But uh, hey, Corey yeah. Kluber out there really helping the the, the Cleveland franchise. One of again. when you know maybe something fun with this offseason is to make the like like a in our lifetime Cleveland Guardians team and b a while we were paying attention Cleveland Guardians team like like Joe Carter might be in a lifetime team for me, but I really wasn't paying attention to baseball when he was here. So like just but like Corey Kluber is definitely on both of those teams' pitching staffs for me. Like he is an all time great. Uh, controversial take here, maybe not controversial take, talking about Corey Kluber to end this. Do you think, A, he should, and B, does he get his number retired? Because I think he should. I don't know if he does. By Cleveland? Yeah. They don't have anybody retired that's not in the Hall of Fame. Like, not just the Cleveland Hall of Fame, but the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. There's nobody up there that's retired that's not in the Hall of Fame, and I don't think he's making the Hall of Fame. So, no, I, I would just for what he has meant for the last several years of the franchise. But uh, I don't think, I don't think, I don't know if it's going to happen. They would have mm-hmm. to break their traditional uh, uh, values there, I guess. And Cleveland is certainly a fan of their traditional values. I, <laughs> that was a, so just inside joke when I was a, a kid in college was it felt like with every single time they added someone like Dave DeLucci, that like there was some kind of morals contract we didn't know about that like every single free agent signing for a time was good guy, good human being. Uh, so when you talked about that, it just, I had a, a flashback to that. If we talk about Dave about Delucci, we'll be here all day and it will not be uh, a good conversation. No, so we should no. move on. We should move on, which is a perfect time to let's, you know, that would have been an unsafe thing. Let's talk about something safe right here on the show. Let's talk about simply safe. Our newest sponsor, at least until Wednesday, let's do some sponsor. Uh, Why well, just having a brain collapse there but you know it's doing some bonds sponsor spoilers there we go but simply safe is a company that i first heard about through podcasting advertising it has obviously been very successful for them we are very thankful for their business in coming here and advertising with us and why has it been so successful successful because it works like plain and simply if this product didn't work do you think they could still be on ever growing amount of platforms it is a successful product that gets used like i said I had the unit in the house I bought. So when we moved in, uh, you know, I checked out all the parts and pieces. It's solid. It's well-made. It 
looked easy to install. It looked easy. It was easy to uninstall, to move around. Uh, <laughs> as I said, I'm going to cough 40 times in this podcast here. But the important thing with Sys- Simply Safe is it's not just that it's like, okay, you get alerts, you get alarms. It's There's a monitoring system. They have a home monitoring system, 24-7 professional monitoring. So if something is awry, they're going to call the police on your behalf. They're going to make sure that you are protected at all times. And you can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com backslash locked on MLB. Save 20% on your Simply Safe security system when you sign up for an interactive modeling m- monitoring plan, not modeling plan. I, you know, that might be more intriguing to some people. Interactive monitoring plan and get your first month free. Visit simplysafe.com locked on MLB to learn more. There's no safe like Simply Safe. And again, companies that last in this market, you know them. And they last for a reason. So just keep that in mind with our good friends over at Simply Safe. Now, let's bounce back around after that ginormous ad read because I coughed like three times. I, it, again, something about going on mic. Like I sat here and chugged water and told Justin, I'm going to start coughing the minute we start recording because that's what's happening of late. And of course, it's happened. <laughs> again. <laughs> um, so speaking of coughing. Uh, the Yankees coughed up their only, uh, uh, one of their left-handed relievers. Uh, so I don't, okay, here's my view on it. Chapman, if you missed it, our, uh, um, a Chapman, I'm not going to risk butchering his name is being, uh, released from their roster. And one can make the case. He may never pitch in the majors again at the age of 35 after a negative war season and massive amounts of baggage. Let's be honest. Uh, the thing with Chapman is I am conflicted as a fan of humanity. He doesn't appear to be a good representation. So, hey, cool. glad he's not there. As a fan of the Cleveland Guardians, he's been trash this year. He's been a dumpster fire. His velocity has dropped the last two years. Uh, if they were going to go to him just because Cleveland is a lefty heavy lineup, that could have massively played into their favor. Uh, I guess, you know, what are your thoughts What are your feelings? And do you think much like our Corey Kluber comments a few minutes ago that this is the end of the line for him? Yeah. I I, left-handers who throw 97, I guess are are becoming more common. I don't know if they're super common, but uh, I I feel like he'll get another chance somewhere. Someone who doesn't really care about who they sign uh, and just needs a lefty who can close games. All he hasn't really been their closer for a while, but I, I don't know. I, on one hand, I feel like, yeah, he hasn't pitched well this year, and, and Cleveland could have taken advantage of that, but also he's a lefty, and they don't hit lefties well, and I feel like he probably would have been a pretty good reliever for them, given that matchup. For as bad as he's been all year, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he pitched well against Cleveland. So that, looking at the roster, I feel like that puts him down to one lefty. Yeah, so uh, yeah. stay they in have, Miami, uh, I guess. They have Lucas, uh, who... If I try to say his name, I will get it wrong because it's not pronounced. Lucas Lucas Litke. It's a V. Yeah, it's this yeah. is not that is not one of your uh, things you have to worry about. As a he is, it is not spelled like it sounds. No, and then uh, Nestor Cortez, who you know is a starter, might be a Matt Blake success story, old friend of the organization. But yeah, it it, it leaves him with the one lefty reliever, and I mean he was quite good for them this year, and it, it's a, a relatively strong bullpen. I really liked their uh, going out and adding Scott Efros at a, to me, a relatively cheap price. Uh, interesting arm, but I mean, they got a guy with what five years of control who also saved ten games. So they they made some like nice lower level maneuvers. It's an interesting team. We all know the Yankees are going to spend. They have Aaron Judge, you know, the biggest name in baseball this year, maybe literally as well as figuratively. To prepare for this, we know there's going to be roster changes. Because Savali is getting added. Like, that makes it easy. We don't know the Nick Sandlin of it all. So well, let's just start there. What happens if Sandlin's down? Do you think they're adding, you know, is it just Sandlin for Savali? Is it another move occurring? Who moves up the chart without Sandlin in kind of that role is the the fifth, sixth righty? I would have to think it's it's. Cody Morris, he wasn't on the on the wild card roster, which I didn't understand. We talked about how Tampa Bay is not a left handed heavy hitting team, and they added Kirk McCarty for some reason. I thought that was a very strange move. And the Yankees, if you look at their roster, very right handed heavy. They have a couple switch hitters 
Anthony Rizzo is their only left-handed hitter, but they are very right-handed heavy. Um, and they're most of the, their two of their three switch hitters are bench players. So I would think it's got to be Cody Morris based on those matchups. Now, I don't know if anybody in the Yankees lineup who is right-handed has like, you know, better splits against righties and lefties. Maybe that was the case with Kirk McCarty. Maybe some of the right-handed hitters didn't perform well against lefties and we didn't, you know, dig that deep into things. Maybe we should have, but, uh, I mean, the, the management doesn't look that deeply at Cleveland's own guys. So I don't think they're maybe. looking at the but, other side of things. <laughs> I will say, and I don't want to scare anybody, and I, I have no insight on this, but I will say just from my being in the ballpark Saturday, um, I walked into the ballpark and I saw a guy pitching in the bullpen for the Guardians, and I it was, you know, like 10 a.m. And I was like, wow, I don't recognize this guy. Who is this? I can't, I can't figure out. Because usually I can see from miles away in the stadium, however far I am, by a guy's throwing motion, I can tell you who it is. Couldn't figure out this one. It was Brian Shaw. He was throwing in the Guardians bullpen. So I'm not saying he's going to be added to the roster in case Nick Sandlin can't pitch, but I'm I'm also saying there's probably a non-zero chance that it's could be Brian Shaw. Like I'm just saying, don't like be you know stunned out of the blue if it is. I'm not saying he's going to. I have no in, inside knowledge on this. I'm just saying with my own eyes, I watched him pitch in, in the bullpen Saturday before the game and. Um, yeah, you just never know. I don't know. I know nobody claimed him and they offered to let him stay. So I'm just going to choose to believe it's that and not like not going to full panic mode with this. Like, I know it's Halloween, but why are you trying to scare everybody, Justin? It's it's not the right. <laughs> just getting everybody prepared. It's, okay. This is the that, wrong scary job. story. This is the wrong, our job scary is to prepare story. people. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Mo- Cody Morris makes the most sense in this situation. Hopefully that's the case for Sandlin. Uh, but what 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 other moves do you think could occur to help uh, get Savale on this roster? I, I think it's just as simple as dropping McCarty for Savale. You don't need all those spots. I think they have enough. You know, you only need four starters because of the strange off days, which we'll get into. But um, you only need four starters. One of your starters can go twice, and you have you know four starters total. So I well, think it's as simple as dropping McCarty for Savale. Let's get into it then uh, with the pitching staff, the weird starts, everything else. I think we know, barring a massive change, it's going to be Quantrell in game one, which would set him up to be in one and four. Like, what are your thoughts? How do you think they're going to set up the rest of this rotation for the postseason if that is how things are going to play out? If I had to guess, it'll be Quantrell one, Bieber two, McKenzie three, um, Quantrell four, and then game five. Uh, I guess if you get to game five, you kind of, everybody's on available. Uh, you could go to Savali. It depends on how they use him. So Savali hasn't pitched since October 5th game five, I think is the six. No, 16th is uh game three. So game five would be, I'm sorry. Game five would be 17th. That would be 12 days between outings. So if he, if Aaron Savali is on this roster, I would think that he is going to pitch in some role, but uh, I'm not sure how they'll line up for five. I guess you just try to get through the first four and hope you win by then. And if you get to five, everyone's available. Maybe you go back to Bieber on short rest in game five. Um, so have Savali available. The only guy that probably couldn't pitch is Quantrill and uh, maybe McKenzie. No, it's and it'll be interesting to see how New York rolls this out. Uh, you and I were talking a little bit beforehand. Uh, it's certainly at least from my perspective, it feels like the Yankees are handling this wrong. Uh, I thought their best pitcher far and away is Nestor Cortez, who's also a lefty. Getting him set up to pitch in two games in the series, uh, sometimes you have to like not let egos get in the way, and you have to just tell a Garrett Cole, like, hey, you're currently our number two. You are not our number one. You're 31 years old. There's some signs of age. And He's 32, yeah. 32 my bad it's, but you know so it, it's so old <laughs> he no it's not i mean i'm yeah i'm almost a decade on him but in baseball terms it is you know that's, that's just yeah. the sad truth of it but you got nestor cortez and then again maybe this is the you know I, i've talked about using game theory and other things maybe the thought process is you you're not getting one of cleveland's best pitchers in game one anyways you're saving nestor cortez then for game two and then if you need it maybe he has the short rest on game five but we don't know who it's going to be after that and i do kind of as crazy as this might be i think i prefer cleveland's top three starters to new york's i agree with you that 
Cortez probably, given the matchup, is is their best option, especially if you want to go with him twice. Like Nestor Cortez twice against the Guardian struggles against lefty sounds pretty good to me. I don't know if it's an like you're right, is it an ego thing? I don't know. Um yeah, I I would think it'd be Cortez, but I guess when you get past the game three, everybody, you know, if you get to a game four, you're gonna have everybody available and ready, right? And they don't have a game three starter yet, so but you're right. The game theory thing also is uh, is a thing there that you're going against Quantrill and and it may not matter. Uh, but he he did have one good start. If I, not that this means anything because things have changed so much since then. But Quantrill did have one good start in New York this year. No, oh, it's it's all very good points. We're gonna take a quick break here. Come back, continue to talk about like this Yankees team in general. We're, we've talked a lot about the Guardians. We think you know the Guardians. Tomorrow, we're going to cross over with uh, Stacey Gatsoulias from Locked On Yankees, who um, you know I've had on the show before. She's a, a great person, so make sure to check that out. But we'll take a commercial break. We're going to come back and dive into kind of our view on this Yankees team, which I think is a team the Guardians could conceivably win against. But that'll come in segment two, or segment three, I should say, of Locked On Guardians. And we are back. Short break if you missed it. Uh, so I guess, you know, just looking at these Yankees team, these Yankees teams, no, this Yankee team, who do you think is their third starter? Is it Tyon? Is it Severino? And if it's Severino, like, how much can you put on a guy who, like, didn't pitch really in, since 2018 in, in any, like, heavy, he hasn't thrown 20 uh, innings any year between 2022 and 2018. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess I would go with Tyone because he's been there all year and and he is the most ready. And you could, you know, Domingo Herman could be on the roster and you can kind of piecemeal that together. Um, I don't know. I guess maybe they'll see how game games one and two go, right? I guess that's, that's your game theory <laughs> thing. See how games one and two go and then maybe go from there to see who um, is best matched up. Uh, on the road. I don't know. Oh, I would Tyon just feels like a Zach Please act type to me anymore. Maybe like a better version, like, but in fairness, maybe closer to a Savale, but he's not I mean he's a he's a four, right? Can we kind of agree that he's like more of a four, maybe a three? Like to throw him out there kind of speaks to the lack of depth that the Yankees have in that staff overall. Well, that's why they went out and got Frankie Montas. And obviously, we don't know his status right now. He had shoulder inflammation back in uh, September 16th that he hasn't pitched since. So we don't know what his status is. They're also very banged up, too. Matt Carpenter, uh, I know we're talking about, not talking about the uh, offense yet, but he was great for them this season when they got him. He's been banged up. They think he might be ready to go for the series. We'll see. But um, Benintendi's yeah, got a broken hand. He, after he's done. Out. Yeah, so it's like, I mean, they traded for Benintendi and Montes, where they're two, two, I mean, and then, like I said, Scott E. Efros was a, was a great ad. They made three nice additions to their roster, and then two of them may not even play in the postseason. I'm just looking at Larry Severino's game log here. Um, seven innings is last time out, granted, against the Rangers, not a great team, although they have they have some good hitters in that team. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think Tyone... Just- I would go with Severino. I'm just I'm just looking yeah. at the past several outings. I would say Severino's got to yeah, be their three. And then just to talk about like, their bullpen, Brit, Zach Britton, Chad Green, Michael King, Wandy Peralta, all hurt, all not going to appear in this one. That's that's four significant hits to that bullpen. Which you know, again, Chapman has not been good this year, but they're running out of, of choices. Like th- that's. You know, is Jonathan, I always get his name wrong, Loisinga, like, is that their closer now? Is it Lou Trevino, who they got from Oakland? Like, they they don't have a dominant, scary guy at the back of their pen. Their bullpen isn't even as good as Tampa's right now due to injuries, in my opinion. opinion. Yeah, and and Clay Holmes was hurt to end the year. He didn't pitch. Clay yeah. Holmes' last, <clears throat> uh, last game pitched was... It's been a while. I want to say his last game pitch was September 26th. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he has not pitched in quite a while. The season went a week after that. And uh, if you look at his splits, Jeff, he had a 484 ERA in the second half. And that comes with a 441 FIP. So he was, you know, bad both ways. Um, 
strikeout rate went from 27 to 21. The walk rate went from five and a half to 11, almost 11 and a half. His, um, oh wow. In August, he was 12% walk rate, September 7% walk rate. So he got worse. Uh, a lot of it comes up from, from July, but still yeah. he got better. I guess he got better, but he was walking more late in the season. And I think the thing we can see too, is like, if you look at something like bat pip for pitcher, like if we're trying to predict like, okay, what ha- well, his first half bat pip was in the two fifties, which is about 40 points below. At, so he was very lucky. Second half was a two seventy one, So he wasn't, he was still below average in terms of that. So it's not like it was bad luck necessarily either. Like you can't sit there and, um, put it all to that. But yeah, no, the walk rate doubling in the second half is definitely something to look at as well. And he's, I mean, he was their guy and it's the best him, this year. Yeah, without him. I mean, and then with all those other injured players we talked about, it's a very pedestrian bullpen and you have those top two starters and then Severino likely, you know, will be the third one. He's very good. Only 19 starts this year. Uh, you just worry about fatigue for someone like him who, again, he hadn't thrown 20 innings since 2018. He just he got mm-hmm. hurt and hurt and hurt again. So this is a team that, um, you know, I, one can make a case. We were talking about uh, Lucas. I, I No, that's Severino. I'm sorry. That like that, that explains why I had the wrong data there. But that, you know, their top relievers are all hurt or hurting. And I just don't know. I, I, to me, that's again the huge advantage for Cleveland, right? Like they're going to have. I I think the pitching staffs are about equal. Bullpens are not equal. Lineups not equal. But that's why I'm not. There's a lot of reasons why this Yankees team cratered in the second half, and I'll just point it out. Put it out there right now. Like the AL East didn't win a game so far. Maybe they were a little <laughs> overrated. Yeah, that, that was weird. I mean, t- well, Toronto's bullpen we knew was shaky too. Um, yeah, Tampa Bay we knew was bullpen was shaky too, and the Yankees bullpen is shaky. You know what? A lot of the postseason comes down to bullpens, but I saw a lot of Toronto writers talking about the the issues of Toronto's bullpen. I saw we knew about Tampa Bay's bullpen not being good because of injuries, and hey, it turned out Pete Fairbanks, their best reliever, hurt. Got hurt. Yeah. So uh, Cleveland has the healthiest and best bullpen out of anybody right now. And really we're talking about playoff series. It comes down to who's healthy, doesn't it? If you don't have guys available, you can't win. Uh, not kind wood. Cleveland has uh, Nick Sandlin did play a big role in that postseason series. We'll see what happens, but yeah. I mean, the Yankees um, were using Chi Chi Gonzalez towards the end of the year, who I remember is like a first round pick of Texas out of, I want to say like Oral Roberts, who's like been like this patron saint of like league average. Like he has now had, 68 games, 52 starts over the last seven years. It's just the guy where teams are like, uh, we need a starter. We need a warm body. And the Yankees were, as they're fighting for the division, like there was a lot of people who thought that if this season went on another month, which of course that's not how baseball works, that that the Yankees would have faltered all the way. That they were going to, that you know, that they were in danger of, of pulling a New York Mets. That basically both New York teams were going to slide. I heard some chatter. And when the things are on the line, they go and do this because that's how desperate they were for pitching depth. So I think it's, it is interesting. Yes. They have Aaron judge. Like there is that their lineup is, you know, some guys might've cooled off, but Rizzo still had a really strong year. You know, uh, uh, Stanton had a nice rebound. Uh, Osvaldo Cabrera has been excellent for them since they called him up. Uh, a lot of low batting averages. Yeah. And then they've got in, they're like a, a higher paid guardians because you look at it, it's like, okay, Harrison Bader, he is Miles straw like defensively. And with his bat, uh, interesting that like they have the defensive wizard shortstop that, uh, you know, Cleveland actually gave up some defense at shortstop to get someone with a little more offensive profile. The, the Yankees have a lot of defensive specialists as well. So it's, it's a lot about guys like judge and Rizzo doing the damage. And, you know, I probably should have said in segment one, but I thought it was kind of interesting after all of our talk about no power, the Guardians only scored runs via the home run in <laughs> yeah. the first series. I mean, all runs in that entire series were via the home run. And then, you know, you, you got Aaron Judge, who's pretty good at what he does. Now, the layoffs there, do you think that's going to have an effect? 
Yeah, I don't know. We've never we've never seen that before in baseball. We've never seen teams go six days between playing games. Um, ex, you know, spring training was probably the last time they had six. To, it, there is never been. A, I think even spring training, you don't have six day layoffs. So uh, we've never seen it in baseball unless you want to talk about I don't know nine eleven. That was a long layoff, but that doesn't really count here. And hasn't happened in a long time. So yeah, we've never seen it. We've never seen a team with this long of a layoff playing. I'm not sure if it'll factor in. Or if it, if it, how it'll factor in, I should say. No, it's it's going to be interesting to see because, like you said, it's just something we've never seen. Uh, any kind of closing thoughts on today's show? I don't know. No, I, I definitely agree with you on the Nestor Cortez thing. Having him go twice would be probably better for New York. I'm not sure. I, I don't imagine he has like any crazy splits against righties. I'm sure he's um, pretty uh, splits are, yeah, he's good no matter what you do. Um, yeah. Just curious to see how Cleveland lines they're pitching up. I think, I think the two off days are good for Cleveland because uh, you can see them go to, and I'm glad, I'm glad they gave Sam Hench's run. It almost seemed like to me that they were afraid to use Sam Hench's because Tampa Bay was so right-handed heavy and he comes out and he's there, you know, he's dominant. Like he has been in the whole second half. He was nasty. Um, and I know the Yankees are right-handed heavy again, so I hope they're not afraid to use Henches. I think he's proven that he has been um, a, a force to be reckoned with out of the bullpen. I hope they do it again. But Cleveland can really leverage their their bullpen. If Cleveland has the advantage in the bullpen this series, they can really um, go to it those first two games with the off days and try to get a win in, in New York. And um, also, Tristan McKenzie has the highest fly ball home run rate, fly ball issues of anybody on the team. Um, he should go game three in Cleveland. You don't have to worry about him in New York with his fly ball issues. Everybody else is, is pretty good at keeping the ball on the ground. So um, Cal Quantrill might be oddly a very good yeah. uh, matchup in New York with the way he pitches. He doesn't get a lot of uh, strikeouts, but he keeps the ball in the ballpark better than anybody on this team. You know, Shane Bieber gives up home runs. Mm-hmm. Um, Aaron Savali gives up home runs. Tristan McKenzie gives up home runs. Cal Crunchell is the one guy that limits home runs the best out of any of their starters. Might be oddly an oddly good matchup in New York. No, agreed. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I think that it's a very good point that Quantrill is the best fit because of everyone else is kind of that uh, the high home run one. I agree with you. Which I, again, uh, I guess I'm supposed to make this more interesting by being like, no. You fool. Um, he's going to give up four home runs because he's due. They're showcasing him for next for this offseason. Uh, uh, and then, uh, yeah, no, it, I, it, controversy is supposed to help, right? Uh, I'm kidding. No, I, I fortunately agree with you because I think it's an intelligent take. Uh, sorry if that's not what people are here for. But I mean, based on the comments on the YouTube, I need to just mute the mic uh, for a whole segment. Like literally someone said, can you just give Justin a segment? So everyone's loving you. So I got to pull back uh, a little bit more. Nobody it's wants been that. great having you. Is no, I mean, not according to the comments. Uh, you, you, uh, they want more Justin. So we'll start giving them more Justin as much as we can. <laughs> uh, I want to thank. <laughs> I think the only person who doesn't want that is Justin. Uh, <laughs> but I have I have greatly enjoyed having you as the new co-host. Uh, these will continue to be fun as this team continues to be fun. And then, let's be honest, no matter what happens, it's a great team, a great run, a great ride. And the minors are still very beautiful, which is a specialty of yours as well. Uh, so this the fun never ends, no matter what happens. We might be down for a day or two, like at, what every other organization is. But uh, I think this is a very fun team to cover and will be for a long time. I'm very glad that uh, the schedule. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it too. This has been a great fit so far. I've, en- I've really enjoyed our conversations, but uh, I'm especially happy that these games are Tuesday, Thursday with uh, days off in between. That'll give us a ton of time to talk about stuff this entire week with yes. our schedule. And Hey, they're, you know, they're evening games. Uh, can I talk about how it's like, I, I understand why things are on TBS and things like that, but man, wouldn't it be nice if like, the games were on places where everyone could watch them just, you know, from the outsider perspective of like, not even as like cord cutter. I grew up without cable. I grew up in a household with where we pinched our, pinched our pennies and all that. So I didn't have cable, but I could always watch the games. They were always like ABC or something. I kind of hate to see that 
there's going to be people who may not see these games just as a minor throw in here at the end not something i prepared justin for just something i kind of wanted to throw in feels like come on abc nbc someone bid on these games so like all fans can watch i mean to be fair there were a couple playoff games on abc the first round uh Mm -hmm. or just one and then one was flipped over but yeah i'd like to see more of that too you know i think uh the nlcs is on fox that's you know that's it uh they're on yeah fs1 slash fox for some but some of them are just fs1 well the nl nlcs will will shift to fox once that's uh once they make it to the next round i think it's all fox and nlcs no they have some fs1 uh the first nlcs yeah first two games for atlanta and philly are on fox then the next three are on fs1 and then the entire dodger series is on fs1 what about i mean what about when they get to the next round when they get oh you're right never mind yeah, in the next round. No, it is it, it's FS1 for the next round as well. Yeah, there Just are some kidding. Fox games. It's it's really weird. And then World Series switches to Fox. So yeah. everyone can watch that. But yeah, I don't know. It's just a personal thing. <laughs> as someone who grew up a little poor, uh, I'm like, man, there's so many things. I wouldn't... UAB 43. My love of that channel is for that reason. It's never going to go away. Uh, but those things don't exist. And you're cutting yourself off from a certain set of fans. And I just think that's unfortunate. Yeah, but uh, you know, this is just some it's bonus baseball. coverage. Some bonus and that has been unfortunately the story of baseball for a long time. Um, I do. I that seems like a natural point. That's baseball for us. To end. Uh, thank you for listening. It has been a lot of fun. We will continue to talk about your AL champion division round sweep winning Cleveland Guardians as they go face the evil empire of New York. Uh, everyone's behind this team right now. Uh, I mean, every Boston fan in the world is currently rooting for Cleveland. I've been Jeff Ellis and for my co-host, Justin Lada. Again, we want to thank you for listening, subscribing, downloading. Please, please. We're under 300 subscribers from getting to 1,000 on YouTube. You can do that math, but it's huge for us to get to 1,000. So I'd really, really appreciate it. anyone who has not. Please subscribe. And how I've ended every show. Go, go, Guardians, go.